What is going on guys? My name is Astro Marine and I am here looking at March of the Eagles today. This is a... Well, I suppose you could consider this a grand strategy game by Paradox Interactive. Um, but I'm not sure, like... It's a very, very limited version of one. I mean, if you play the Europa Universalis or Hearts of Iron or Victoria or a few of the other ones that they have, they're much more grander affairs. This has the trappings of one, but is actually a bit simpler than usual for them, which, uh, for someone as dumb as me, is a very welcome pace. So I thought I'd do something a bit different today. Instead of just looking at and showing you the game and so on, I thought I'd make just a quick guide for this game because I think there's a danger that a lot of people are going to look at it and see just another old paradox game too hard for me etc etc and I just want to tell you guys this game really 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 isn't too hard for you everybody should play it um, I like it quite a bit um, and it's it's pretty damn accessible it's the most accessible game that they've done so far <coughs> So, let's just go through with this. I mean, the, there's single player, multiplayer. The tutorial is actually pretty decent, but I do recommend that, like, if you want to get into the game, read the manual, because it does tell you quite a bit more about the, the, the depths of the game that you won't get just from the tutorial. So, let's just start a single player here to see. Now, this is a warning I want to give people, because I tend to do this... And uh, I tended to do this in other Paradox games, and it's a huge mistake. Don't do that in any game, but especially don't do that in this one. Um, like, France is huge, for example. Spain is huge. Great Britain is, is huge. Um, the tendency at the beginning, I think, is to go, ah, that's too big. There's, like, let me start with something simpler, just a smaller country. Maybe that will be easier to manage. If that's your reasoning, don't do that, because... The games, uh, well, especially not in this game, because it's easy enough as it is. And um, it's not that much more management to play a bigger nation, and dear God, it's easier. Uh, if you're learning this game, if you want to learn this game, start France. Really, just start France. It's going to be a giant thing in the middle of the map. You're going to be stuck right into a war, but still, like, I've tried... I'm Portuguese, so I've tried playing with Portugal like I do... In pretty much every Paradox game, just try that. And uh, I have no chance. I, there's just... I'm too tiny. It's too hard. I mean, you can see by the difficulty here, they're not joking. France is way easier than Portugal, even though it's, it's less manageable. So let's just... That warning out of the way. Let's just start a game with France then. And uh, as... Yeah, yeah, yeah. As any other Paradox game, you start paused. And you can zoom in and out. There's going to be very little reason to be zoomed in this much, but I can do it just to show you guys. And this is like a terrain map. It shows you where the forests are, etc., etc. Uh, you should. The first thing you should do is come in here on the map modes and just choose the political map just to show you, okay, this is my country. These are other countries just like... Divide the world cleanly into what's mine and what's gonna be mine pretty damn soon. Um, now, as all the other Paradox games, this screen is gonna be quite intimidating at the beginning. There's lots of text everywhere. Uh, so these are all your armies and you have a shitload of them at the beginning. With more on other places, as you can see, and so on. Um, this is... Again, like, way less intimidating than it looks. So let me just show you guys quickly the the main screens of the game and what you can do with them. And the reason I want to do that is for stuff like this, for example. This is the best example in this game of why you don't need to worry that much. This is my budget screen, yeah? You see, like, yeah, numbers, maths, please help. No. Here's the things you can do in this screen. You can take loans, you can repay loans. If you hover over... Anything actually, any piece of text or any button in the game, it will tell you what it will give you a tooltip with much more information. And you can see, for example, here I can take a loan for that much with that much interest. It's not going to let me choose the loan, it's not going to, it's just going to tell me how much the banks are willing to give me. Um, 
everything else, like all this information and so on, it's just that. It's just information. You might need it for some advanced decisions later on, either in terms of diplomacy or what you can do with your money or when to spend this or that or the other thing, but for now, this here is just here to intimidate you. Just don't let it. Okay? Um, it's pretty much going to be the same thing on other screens. Like, here is just an overview. Um, it just tells you how good your ruler is. This is Napoleon, so it's pretty damn awesome. Uh, you can sort through these. These are your victory condition provinces, pretty much. Uh... And uh, the only thing you need to care here for now is these decisions. Like, every country has their own decisions. This is just... Hmm. Uh, they're not actually decisions. You're not going to choose, like, different paths or, or anything like that. You're just... They're basically, like, goals that you can strive for. Like, you can uh, territorial swap with Bavaria. So, for example, if you own Ansbach and Beirut... Uh, which are these two territories here, Ansbach and Beirut. If you own these, either because you were at war with uh, with uh, their ruler, which is Prussia, if you're if you decide to go to war with Prussia and you conquer these, you can trade them with uh, Bavaria, which is this guy right here, and you just say, listen, these guys border you, these two guys here, Solingen and Wesel. Um, bother me, let's just swap. Let's, it's it's nice and easy, uh, friendly between rulers, and uh, you can do that. You can choose not to, but yeah. Uh, you can create Kingdom of Italy if you hold uh, Milano, and so on. Uh, you can create Westphalia, you can create, uh, you can break the Holy Roman Empire. These are just things that you might decide to do. Like if you create Italy, you're just going to uh, create a giant satellite of yourself. Satellites are nations that, even though they're independent nations, they pay you tribute and they pretty much follow you into war and uh, do whatever you tell them to. So that might be a good way to, like, once you start unifying this place, then just creating the Kingdom of Italy would be a, a good way to simplify matters down here. And so on and so forth. These are just uh, uh, things you can strive for in your game if you feel so inclined. Uh... Now, uh, this is the this is the most important screen, I believe. Well, not the most important, but it tells you how you can win. And this is the way the game does winning. Uh, you can see here that at the moment, France is the land dominant country. That means I am the guy with the most score in terms of owning um, the provinces that I care about. Every country, every major country, France, Spain, England, Austria, Prussia, every one of them has different provinces that they care about, that they are willing to go to war for, and that they consider themselves dominant if they have them. And in... Uh, uh, which is a pretty cool feature of the game, like, everybody has their own different... Um, their own different uh, objectives. So, for example, for France... If I'm in France, these are the provinces I care about, you see? Like, the green ones are land dominance provinces, that means... Uh, provinces that are landlocked. Or, not all of them landlocked, but they're just considered land dominance. Whatever that gets decided by, by the designers. Um, and the blue ones are my sea dominance. My naval dominance uh, provinces. Um, these are usually ports, they're sometimes far away, like Ireland, for example, for some reason. Uh, Stockholm, a few places up here in Denmark. Uh, Barcelona, these are ports that I want to own. Is that Venice? Yeah, that's Venice. And so on and so forth. Like, no other country cares about exactly this set of provinces. For example, if I go to Britain, you see that they have a completely different set of provinces that they care about. Some of them overlap, and that's where the interesting part comes in. Because if you're looking to get, like for example, if I'm looking to get Lübeck up here, then I need to check, okay, 
Who else wants Lubeck? Anybody? Prussia wants Lubeck, for example. Okay, so I know that if I want control of this, I'm going to be fighting for it with Prussia, because they're not going to just let me take it. England might. England doesn't give a crap. They don't want Lubeck for anything. So uh, you need to pay attention to your alliances and your, and your opposition that way. Uh, and that's how you win the game. If you're uh, at the moment, I'm 100% lamb dominant, which means actually 114, which means I have pretty much everything that I care about land wise. I'm only missing these three provinces, as you can see, and I can get them relatively easily. Maybe not that one. However, I don't really need to care about these because I have enough. I have enough inland. However, I need to take care of my naval provinces, of which I own zero. While Britain, for example, is the naval dominance country. They have the most they have the most provinces of the of the blue kind. Like all of these they own, uh, Gibraltar they own, and so on and so forth. So if a country is at the same time land dominant and naval dominant, they win the game. That's pretty much the only victory condition. Or to be the guy with the highest prestige or or the highest dominance rating by the time the game ends, which is, I believe, 1820. So you have 15 years to win, kick butt, and to destroy everyone that decides to stand against you. Um, budget we've seen, military is where you can choose your units and where to build them and so on and so forth. Ideas, this is kind of like a tech tree. So at the moment, France has a few ideas already chosen. Like Volley Fire, for example, which is 20% extra to infantry attack. And uh, and some other stuff like this. March to the Sound of Guns, which makes armies just uh, go after battles that happen in nearby provinces if they see one happening. And so on and so forth. But for example, I don't have anything on the economy. I can... I can do this, for example, if I'm planning on getting a shitload of loans. I can do this to reduce my interest and make it easier for me to get them. Uh, and each major country, not the minors, Portugal doesn't get one, but each of the major, major countries has a set of ideas that is specifically to themselves. Everyone else, everybody shares. Um, but French, for example, uh, have Grand Imperial Staff, which gives you lower army frontage, which is something I'll explain much later. Um, Griboval system whatever that means. Uh, it gives you extra artillery attacks, so, and so on and so forth. So they end up, if you choose a lot of the national ideas, you end up getting uh, um, fighting in a different way from, from other people. So actually, I am going to get... I, you start with 215, and each idea costs you 200, so I am going to get the French national idea uh, to reduce my army frontage. What that means basically is is that I'm going to be able to fight with more people in the front lines. But we'll get to that. And this is diplomacy. Uh, this is how you get alliances. This is how you declare war. This is how you uh, sue for peace. This is how you request tribute. All those things, um, which I'll explain shortly. But I just wanted to say, like, this is what you need to do in this game. You need to use diplomacy and you need to use your armies to win. It's really that simple. There's no real uh, manipulation of the economy. There's nothing really that you need to care about except for these two things. It is a war game. Um, so let's look at war then. Armies are generally composed of three types of units just just the bigger types of units is uh, infantry, cavalry, and artillery. There's also guards, which is like a special, like shock troops or, or special troops that are a bit more powerful. And uh, other different uh, uh, small types like light infantry and, uh, and uh, service groups is important. This is logistics trains and so on, so you need these for your armies to run, basically. Um, this is the the basic view of an army, you have the name, how many men it has, how much attrition it's suffering. This basically means if you're fighting in winter in Russia, this number will not be zero. <laughs> um, let's just say it it, uh, it makes you if, you, if you have a bunch of attrition, you're going to lose men. 
You're not going to be able to replenish your men from your from the your country's manpower. It's going to be basically bad. Don't leave your armies unsupplied for long. And that that actually is the crux of the game. That's that's. I think it was Napoleon that said that uh, amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. If it wasn't, it was Clausewitz. Doesn't matter. It's still true. Like, if you're out of supply, you're gonna lose. If you just take your armies and you just go, let's conquer Moscow without a plan and a backup and a way forward that actually lets you do that, you're gonna die horribly. I don't care if you have a th hundred thousand men, they're not gonna get there. They're gonna die of starvation. So this is pretty damn important. Otherwise, like each flank of the army needs a leader. This is basically just the armies that are important, give them the best ones you can. Like, you can sort by overall expertise, which is what I tend to do. Unless I just need very specific things, and eh, whatever. Just don't leave any, fra any flank um, empty in your important armies. That's, that's something you need to take care of. Um, oh, I just wanted to show you something else, so let's go back to this. This is a different army, but it doesn't matter. Um, the, you have a few things you can do here besides giving it leaders. You can detach the slowest brigades if you need to chase. Or if you need to... Um, I don't know. If you need an extra burst of speed because either you need to break a siege of an important province of yours. Or you need to to just cut the retreat of an army that's, that's uh, trying to escape through your lands. Whatever. Uh, the tactical situation requires it. You can just dump the slow pokes and just speed forward if you need to. And this is just if for for if you're organizing your armies and so on, you can just split it as cleanly as possible in half. Uh, this is pretty damn important as well. Uh, this lets you create new units out of your army. Like if you want to split an army, but not just in half with some specific goals, you can do that. Uh, this is for loading them into ships um, to allow replacements. I don't really know why you'd deselect this, but whatever. This is pretty important. This is the March to the Sound of Guns thing that I mentioned earlier. If you click this, then this army will be vigilant. Like, if there's a battle here in uh, Gaon, then this army will actually move to Gaon and fight as well. So, it's pretty important for defensive armies, and it's pretty important if once your armies get a bit more fragmented, to just let them converge together and fight if you get a surprise attack or something like that. Um, this basically prevents them from reti retreating. Um, if you click on this, you see your army will retreat into local fortress on enemy encounters. That means you can leave just like a garrison outside, or if you have an army that's still, I don't know, in preparation, and you suddenly get invaded, you can tell the army to just go into the fortress, uh, fortresses this, these kinds of things, and just stay in. Like, every fortress has a, a garrison, and the army, if you select that, the army just uh, reinforces that garrison, I believe. Alright, son, select that, because I don't want the army to flee. Uh, Scorched Earth, I've never actually used. It basically denies supply and, and uh, reinforcements to the enemy once you pass through a, a place. Force marching moves faster. This is to avoid battles, it just runs away from province to province and tries not to get hit. Um, this is important, again, if you're invading other places, uh, you can leave just little brigades on the way to just guard your supply lines, to just make sure that you have a train of supplies on your way back uh, to, to your starting base, so that you don't get uh, out of supply and you don't die of attrition. And this is just to disband the whole thing. Uh, the, all of these, like... I was basically too descriptive here, just going, yang, 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 I can buy, I can, but you can see each of these is just a little decision or just a little situational thing that you can do with your army. The same with detail view. Detail view is actually the way you win battles. Supply is the way you win wars, this is how you win battles. So, oh my god, 
so many, so much text and buttons and things. I know, I know, I know what you mean. Here's what matters, though. This is your overall leader. The overall leaders of your important armies should be the best guys you can manage. Because they're the ones that are going to direct these brigades from one flank to the other and from the reserves to the flanks during the battle. Um, they're, they're the important ones. And their skills get added to the skills of the dudes in each, in each flank. I'm gonna say Frank throughout this video. I'm terribly, terribly sorry. So, good guys up here. I mean, I've seen videos, Northern Lion, I'm talking to you, where you just take Napoleon out of the reserves and into a, the center because you think that's the most important. No, don't do that. You're gonna lose and die horribly. Napoleon stays in the reserves because that's where he belongs, just directing the whole battle. Um, this is one thing you need to take care of, just keeping your best generals uh, as in overall command of the armies. Then, you have to make sure that each of these flanks isn't gigantic. Like, if you have a 100,000-man army, first of all, you're doing it wrong. It, you should, it shouldn't be that big. And second of all, don't keep them all in the, in the, in the flanks or the center, because... Uh, the places you're going to be fighting, either a breach in a fortress, or a mountain pass, or whatever. Some of these places just allow very small fronts. This is that frontage thing that we've talked about, that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, I don't know... I don't know exactly how to see it, to be honest. Um, this gives you the supply limit. You can see on the bottom right uh, each province and what the supply limit is like if you have more than 60,000 men here uh, they can't be resupplied by the province itself they ha they need to get supplies from somewhere else which doesn't matter in France because it's mine and never I run everything else around it but it matters in Saxony so that's one information but I'm trying to figure out the frontage of this and not seeing it I don't know anyway that's for my advanced guide no, I just have no idea. I need to recheck the manual. So, but the important thing is, don't leave, you know, like, ten brigades on each flank, because they won't be able to fight all by the, uh, all at the same time. And, uh, that's one thing that's important, just to keep some things in reserve, because the general will throw troops from reserve into the flanks as needed to either reinforce or take advantage of a... Of a breach or something like that they'll do it by themselves this is a simulator it's not a like a complete tactical minutia war game where you need to take care of these things uh, this is how you tell armies what to do not by putting specific units here and there but these things these are orders you can give the army um for for these orders you see i can't actually move the mouse to show you but you can see in the bottom each order has a condition. Um, in this case, it you need that flank to have a leader, and you need either at least 15% cavalry or 15% light infantry on that flank to be able to, uh, to do this order. So, for example, now you actually have only 14 point something percent, so you can't delay. But, for example, if I take this, and I put it, uh, let's say, I'll put it in the reserves. Now, I can select this, because now I have 20% cavalry in this flank. You see, so this is another way why you shouldn't want just a giant dump of units on each flank. You should have exactly what you need for the tactic you want. So if I wanted to delay on this flank, I could. And then you can see what this order does. Those were the conditions. What they do is specified over there. So on the bombard phase, on combat phase, on pursue phase, they're just gonna get bonuses. In this case, a very, very, very high defensive bonus and a, a, a much lower attack bonus. So this is, you would choose this, for example, if you had uh, damaged or low morale or otherwise ineffective units you would put them here with a little cavalry guard just to make those 15 percent 
in order to delay so that this flank gets very few casualties. So this would be another one, for example. If you have at least 20% cavalry, which we do, then you can have a smaller defense bonus than, than the delay, but a much larger attack bonus. So you have to manage things like this. You have to figure out what you want each flank to do and choose one. Those events that it says on the tooltip, these potential events, this is just stuff that can happen during the battle that normally is very important. You don't control these. They just... If you choose this tactic here, you're gonna have a chance of, of those events. Push forward, charge cavalry, or limited retirement. What they do depends per event. Normally, very, very good things for you, very, very bad things for the other people. So, each of these is for a different situation, like counterpunch would be just to try to delay at the beginning and then pursue. You see that during the pursue phase, you get a much higher attack bonus. And so on and so forth. So, deliberate assault, you need a uh, combined arms flank, and you're just gonna get a uh, lower defense bonus, but a much higher infantry, uh, artillery, and cavalry attacks, depending on which phase it is. It's easier than it looks but uh but i understand that it doesn't look easy at all it's not like this isn't mario it's not gonna be simple but it's much simpler than you think it is you just choose a tactic here normally if you have this one available choose this one as you can see like it has a giant bonus for everything especially your own guard units which are already better than everything else and those events are also massive and, uh, yeah, like, if you have, this is, this is, uh, March of the Eagles 101, apparently. If you have the possibility of choosing up the guard in a flank, choose up the guard in that flank and just leave it there. Um, that would be my advice. So, yeah, building guard units is, uh, pretty damn important. So, the, uh, that's these. Um, which I only have on that flank. How much do I need? I actually need only 10% guards, so I could potentially move this, for example, to the left flank and uh, move the artillery to... sorry, to the right flank, that one. Artillery to the left, one of these infantry units to the reserves. And suddenly, well, I should be able to get this... oh yeah, I need a leader, of course. So I'll just choose this guy, and suddenly I can choose up the guard here. So this is what you need to do in terms of organizing armies, just spread around your units so that you can choose effective formations and then go fight. That would be pretty much it. Now, yeah, like if you want, there's other things, like if you want you can uh, combine armies so that you don't have these, these three million stacks running forward, so for example, I'm gonna combine these two. Uh, um, I've seen people do it online, and it seems like a good idea. Just try for, let's say, 40,000 to 50,000 men um, maximum. Because, I mean, you saw, you saw right there that, um, that um, these places have, you know, 90,000 supply limit, 70,000 supply limit. This is going to be true everywhere. You see, this place has 50,000. So, if you're going to be attacking those places, uh, that would be bad. So, for, especially, like, up here in the mountains, you see here in Switzerland, 20,000 supply limit. So, either you think very carefully how you're going to attack Switzerland, or you're going to suffer a shitload of attrition. That would be bad. But, yeah, like, 50,000 is something that I saw used, then it seems pretty damn effective. Like, I don't want to keep this guy here, that should be coming closer. Um, this is a giant stack of 65,000. I'm going to keep that 56 there, I'm going to combine these 9,000 into another army, let's say. Something like this, just to make it a bit more manageable, you know? You, you don't need to keep all these stacks independent, and you shouldn't, because stack number 20 is gonna get no guard units, it's gonna get the shittiest leaders you have, it's just not gonna be effective. So, you should have a few stacks 
and that would be it. So, I'm rambling, but that's the thing you should care about military-wise. Like, now you know about military. Pretty much everything you need to. These things are the things that need your attention right now. You have too many unemployed leaders, that's true, but I'm not gonna care right now. Um, or I might just, whatever, just give random dudes. Just keep, keep clicking until it stops. Um, but since we're gonna combine stacks pretty damn soon, I don't want to do this right now. Uh, your ports are blockaded, that's very true. They're just talking about this one. But the British have scary, scary, scary ships. I'm not gonna mess with that right now. Just let them blockade. I have supply from everywhere else. I don't actually need that port. And your country's at war. That's true, we're at war with England. Now, let's go for the diplomatic map. This is France, right? It's us. We own outright a shitload of countries down here. Where? They're, they're satellites. Um, this is actual France, but these are satellites of France and so on. Stuff that's gonna come into war with you pretty damn easy. Um, others are just allies, like um, the Netherlands and Spain. These you need to keep relatively happy. Uh, I'm actually... I don't know. I don't think Spain is a member of our coalition. So we can go to diplomacy and then try to find Spain here, whatever. But we can just click on Spain itself and then click there and suddenly we're in the diplomacy window with Spain. We can do a bunch of things. Insult them if you want a lower score. Send expeditionary force basically means we give them an army for a while. If they're at war and we need to save them or whatever. Uh, in this case, I just want a call to arms. So I just want them to aid us in this war. I send a diplomat. I have two more. So you have a limited number per month of things you can ask other people to do. In this case, I'm asking them to join in my war against England. Uh, I don't think I need to do the same with these. Maybe I do. Ah, no. Oh, is a satellite of France. Okay, so satellites you don't need to ask. I didn't realize that the Netherlands was actually a satellite. So, this is the war with England, but England is far away and I need to, like, swim to get there? That's ugly. I don't want to do that right now. So what I want to do is attack something else. So, this is the game now. I can't really explain you anything else. Um... Now is when you have to define your own strategy, like, how do you want to win? Do you want to go for these two places? Do you want to go attack England outright? Do you want, like, it's your decision, basically, what you're gonna be doing. At the moment, let's say... At the moment, let's wait. I think Brunswick is going to attack me, which prevents me from having to declare war. So let's just unpause now, so that we can work on our armies a little bit. And uh, we'll see what happens. So, we're unpaused, but we're very slow right now. So I'm just gonna increase speed to level 3, let's say. While these armies move all over the place. Now, Spain has honored our military coalition, that is fantastic. And Britain formed the coalition against us, that is less fantastic. Well, let's keep going for now. Until these places start consolidating. You see now, this army is already there, so I can m merge the selected units right there to form only one army, led by the strongest people from the armies that I selected. So these are 45,000. Let's merge them. 37,000. Let's merge them. 56,000. Let's merge them. You see, all of a sudden I have four bigger armies. And this one is also on the way to... Let's make it on the way there. And we can do the same thing right here. But I don't want to care about Italy right now. Let's just worry about up here. Now... Brunswick didn't do anything. I'm just gonna declare war on them. 
it's automatic, they, they can't refuse my own war. So let's just take the Grand Armée, led by Napoleon himself, into a little expedition into Brunswick. While we do that, we can take our smaller army up here and go fight these guys, because they're gonna try to come into Nordhausen, I think. Yeah, there they go. Oh, now they're going in there, so okay. We'll just move to Göttingen instead. Aha! Okay, so that made them th rethink their strategy, and they're just gonna stay down there. I'm actually gonna reduce speed a bit, because I want... What are they doing? They're going into Braunschweig. Braunschweig? Where the hell is Braunschweig? I don't even know. Whatevs. Let's just, ah, it's there. They're running away. Okay. Let me try to chase them. Sneaky bastards. Now they're going into Verden. Hmm. Okay, Russia are now at war with us, together with Great Britain. That's Russia. <laughs> this is suddenly looking problematic, but we're gonna get there. I'm just chasing this little stack here to give Napoleon time to actually get up here. I could ask Prussia for access. I don't think they're gonna accept, but if they give it to us... Oh, they actually will. Okay. Just ask military access so that I can redo this... Okay, they allowed it, so I can actually go through this territory right here. So, they're going to Hanover. Now they're going to be sieging Hanover. Except that I don't think they can, or can they? Hmm. Ah, yes. You see, this is a siege. They can decide to assault, but that would be a bad idea because my fortress is still intact. Uh, you can see here in the outliner, if I remove cities, garrisons, okay, that should be enough. Um, okay, so they actually gave up on the Siege of Hanover before I had a chance to show it to you guys. Let's see if I can actually catch the bugger. Yes, now, this is a battle. These are all the stages that I mentioned earlier. These are all going to happen automatically. This looks complicated. You don't need to care. What you need to do is just to look and figure out what's the conditions that are favorable to the battle and what conditions aren't. So in this case, we're in supply, so that gives us a 10% bonus. They're not. They're in our territory. So they don't get that bonus. So already I'm ahead of them in battle. They have... 25% attack, 25% defense bonus from the leader. From the combination of leaders. But they don't have any on the left flank or the right flank because they don't have any armies there. So I have a shitload of bonuses better than them. And because I'm outflanking them, this is going to be a giant massacre. And you're going to see here that for each tick of, of combat, they're going to lose a shitload more people than I will. So, for example... 114 of mine, 2,000 of theirs. So, yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, they lost a shitload of dudes, I lost 114 guys. That was pretty easy. Now, as you guys can see, uh, as you fight, your leaders gain traits, which just make them um, better in combat and give them bonuses and stuff like that. So... Göttingen at the moment has these lines here, which means that they're occupied by me, even though they're still owned by Brunswick. Um, to actually win, but you see, like, this war here is at 0% score. So we just had this little fight, but this didn't actually affect anything. Let's now go into sieging this place. I have 28,000, that should be enough. Let's make this a bit faster. Until I get there. Which should be soon. There you go. Now. As you can see. Down here. There's a siege. It's currently at 0%. Because 
The walls are still there, I'm just outside, I just arrived, I'm setting up tents, nothing is happening. I'm getting attrition though, because sieges are dangerous to the health of the siegers. But they have a very, very tiny garrison. The walls aren't that big, there's no fortress, there's only a supply depot there, so they're actually... I could just try to make this siege last and until this place gets breached, the graphics change and, uh, and so on, which makes an assault much easier. But because the odds are stacked so much in my favor, I'm just gonna do an early assault, which it doesn't even warn me right now. Normally it says, be careful, you might lose troops. I think it needs a fortress on the other side. And sieges can be brutal, man. You can lose like 3,000 guys easy, but not in this case. This case, I'm just gonna dominate. But you see, you see right here, I have uh, too many soldiers fighting in the same flank. This is the stuff that you need to avoid. The, remember I said at the beginning that I didn't really figure out frontage and so on? So this is where you see that. Fortress terrain allows for three points of frontage. I have a bunch. So I should have made a much narrower flank on each side and just had a bunch of people in the reserves and uh, that would have been better but whatever we're I'm still gonna win even though you see they're losing less people than I am but their morale made them lose and I win that siege so more traits more traits that place is now mine and I'm at current 100% war score with them so I can just you see, like, war capacity is 100%. They don't have capacity for war, because I took their only city, and I won every battle. This is, this is mine. I own these guys. So let's just make that official. I can sue for peace, and this is what you can do. You have a bunch of uh, things you can do, like demand tribute, which just gives you this thing where you choose, basically, what you want them to do and each thing costs points so you need to choose a deal that is under the war score in this case they would have of course accept nothing or just make them break their their treaty with great britain or just release westphalia as sovereign states or whatever like all these things but i don't care they're tiny i just want them so i asked for annexation and they've accepted. So that's now mine. War is over. This place is now Westphalia. Why? Oh, I think that has to do with these decisions. Create the Kingdom of Westphalia. Huh. Weird. I'm gonna have to figure that thing out better. Any case, we have more pressing matters because British are sieging my fortress. You can see here, hostile sieges, they're sieging Bremen. It's still undamaged, but they have a pretty sizable army. However, I have one army that is double their size and is owned, is led by none other than Napoleon. Okay, so that actually made the kingdom and they became our satellite and now they joined our war and now they're fighting. Uh, let me check. Yeah, they're a satellite of France. Exactly why that happened, I'm not sure. Why the satellite was formed instead of just me owning the territories outright. I don't know. But whatever, the functional result is the same. I own this place, it's gonna give me money and troops and whatever. And it's gonna fight on my side, so that's pretty much all I care. Now, let's see this. Okay, this is an interesting battle. As you can see, like, there's flanks everywhere. There's, uh, Sir Peregrine Maitland. The problem is, I'm much better. Look at this. 3-1-2 as stats, and that guy has 6-6-6. Uh, yeah, you might have heard, Napoleon is kind of a big deal. Now, as you can see, there's a shitload of bonuses. I crossed the river to do this siege. I came from here. One of these places, so I needed to cross a river, and that's gonna give me a penalty throughout the battle. That's bad. However, 
I'm in supply. They're not. They're attacking my siege and they're suffering attrition and their boats are far away and they don't have enough food. So they're actually getting a 50% penalty. I'm gonna rock these dudes in the face. Everything, everything in this battle except for the little river modifier means I'm gonna just destroy them. So let's watch. Yeah, this is not even funny. Look at that. Each tick, 9,000 damage. Okay, so they lost 18,000 men for me, my less than 1,000. Uh, here's gonna be like all the events that happen in the battle. So screening, harassing, and so on. These are all events that you can have with your formations. Those things that I told you to check down here. Actually, I didn't actually set any formations, so this would have been even more in my favor if I had in any case, Napoleon got a trait, I killed the British, I'm gonna be chasing them down, hopefully just to try and get rid of them completely, at least this army, there's, there's more where that comes from, but yeah, okay, that was a complete annihilation, just to get a couple of more traits, that's always pleasant, and like, yeah, I'm, this was a very small campaign, but it was enough for you guys to see what this game is. Like, this is this game. It's That's everything you need. Everything else is just figuring out a strategy that works. So yeah, maybe declaring war on Bavaria, Austria, Prussia, Saxony, England, and Denmark and Sweden at the same time is probably efficient because then you're at war with everybody and you don't have to care about diplomacy. But it's not going to be very effective. <laughs> um, so that's what you need to do. Like... Decide an objective, decide who you're gonna have to either butter up or insult or declare war on to fulfill that objective and then move on. Like, always be mindful of Britain just coming in the rear guard and attacking you, leave some stuff at home, be mindful down here of, uh, of uh, things like Piemont trying to get this from you, uh, Corsica. I think that's Corsica, right? Ah, whatever. Um, no, that's... That's Elba. Okay, never mind. I'm... My geography isn't stellar. Anyway, that's the game, guys. Uh, this was probably a bit too long, but I don't care. That was a... I think a reasonably good beginner's guide to March of the Eagles. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope you get this game. I hope you play it. Because it really should be played by a lot of people. Because Paradox has amazing games that everybody is maybe a bit too scared of. And they really shouldn't. Um, this game is perfectly accessible. And I hope it's going to become a gateway drug for you guys into other Paradox games. So please have fun as always. If you have any questions or comments, either about the game or myself or the channel, please leave them in the section below. I will respond to every single one. And I will see you again next time.